Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Thriving Doctors podcast. Today, I'm del- delighted to be joined by Annika, Annika Vinka uh, from the Netherlands. We don't have many guests on from the Netherlands, so delighted to, to, to speak with you today, Annika. Well, thank you for the invitation, uh, Simon. I'm very happy to, well, to bring some of the experience I have, and I hope some people will yeah, benefit from it or at least think about it and think, oh, this is for me or this is not for me because it's always interesting to listen to views and to how people do things and then decide whether it's helpful for you or not. So nobody yeah. has a full truth, right? Yeah. Um, so the podcast is all about different perspectives and I guess we can try those perspective on perspectives on for size. Yes, yes, that's important. That's very important, yeah. So um, healing then. Uh, yeah, healing. What, yeah. what does healing mean to you, Annika? Well, we had a little prior conversation, right? right. So I had some time to, to, to ponder upon that. And in my mind always pops up uh, the Leonard Cohen song, there's a crack in everything and that's how the light gets in. So healing is, is for me is about Um, coming to terms with the things life has dealt you and it's about growing in spite of the difficulties you had and for me being a therapist in the adoption field not being an adoptee not having adopted not being an adoptive mom not having um, relinquished a child to adoption so I'm from the outer circle but been working the field since 1992 so I've had some people in my practice and seen and, and experienced a lot of stories. Um, I've seen very many types of healing, people that really had to struggle and people that were able to overcome what has um, happened to them. So it, it's all about your personal journey and about finding the tools that will help you. And that that's sometimes quite a, a difficult search because what helps for somebody doesn't help for everybody, right? Yeah, yeah. So, and I coming to terms with things. So, this is 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 this is this peace? Is this before peace? What does what does? Yeah, well, sometimes I think some some things that happen to people will never give you peace, but but maybe you can find some way to accept or to to bear them without being burdened by them that is also a way of healing sometimes you some things that happen to people are too horrendous to to even try to to feel as a therapist some some people really have had the most difficult things you can think about and that's being adopted or experiences prior to adoption um for instance being um looking for the english word evicted from the community where you lived in as a as a small child um and and being left at the side of 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 a road and then being picked up and then being exploited in 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 very many ways or abused in very very many ways and then afterwards being adopted but having a start of that for a number of years, I can only hope that for those children that have become adults now, that they can kind of lay to rest what has happened to them without that influencing them every day, without just knowing this has happened to me and sometimes it will pop up and sometimes it will hurt again and sometimes it will be difficult, Uh, but in general, I can manage to be in the here and now and have a life that is fulfilling for me, that helps me be me. Yeah. So that we we used you used the word perspective a couple of minutes ago. Yeah. Um what you're describing to me, it you know, in with with all that eloquence, uh, seems if I was to put that abbreviate that into simple shorthand that I could get my head around. I would say you're describing a shift in our yeah. perspective. Yeah, a shift in perspective and, and and also a shift in the body because you can only heal 
not only if if you come to terms with thinking about it differently, but also um, if your body heals, because in the end, the body keeps the score, as Basil van der Kolk says. So a lot of traumatic and difficult experiences are held by the body and by um, procedural or automatic responses. So healing for me is also bringing in the body, searching for the personal responses you have, and then finding a way to either resolve them or get them through the system. And then the shift comes because the body has to be at peace for the mind to be at peace as well and the emotions too. Yeah. I, I heard a fantastic phrase this morning listening to a trauma specialist. Uh, and it wasn't it wasn't Bessel van der Kolk, it was um it was Jabo Mate. And he uh, talked about uh yeah, what feeling memory. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's the word that he used. Feel yeah, feeling yeah. Feeling memory. Feeling so that, memory or body memory or or um uh yeah the the felt sense. It's also Mate that says it's trauma isn't what has happened to you, but it has it is what happens inside of you because of what happened to you. I think it was something like that he said. And that's true because trauma, we can we can make a list of traumatic events, but it doesn't mean that somebody gets automatically traumatized if something traumatic happens to, to that person. There's a lot of other things in play as well. Do you have a support network? Was someone there when um when when this happened to you? Was someone there to find new meaning to help you resolve it to be there for you to to soothe you um have have you had prior experiences there's so much that that kind of adds up to how things go for people and whether they need uh, and and which and which therapies or which methods are helpful for them to heal and to find their own purpose in life so the the feeling memory, if that's the word that he used, yeah, yeah, um, really struck home to me because we're talking about with with relinquishment or 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 abandonment, if we want to use a more perhaps uh, loaded, emotionally loaded term. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we're dealing with this pre-verbal stuff. So yeah. um, pre-verbal. Because it's pre-verbal, it's the stuff. It, it's the, the stuff that we don't have words for. So we don't mm -hmm. have, um, you know, when we think about a memory, we think about things that we can remember. Yeah. And and put words too, so we can describe a day when. Uh, okay, so one that comes to my mind, right? I was talking about this. Mm -hmm. One that comes to mind is um, I'd been in the rugby team for like four years, five years. And uh, it was the start of the new season, and I got I got dropped from the from the team, and I was thirteen, and I remember t turning away, uh -huh. turning away so that the other lads didn't see me crying, mm -hmm. yeah. and it and it presumably it's bringing up some I'm being triggered, something in my uh, heal uh, sorry my feeling memory. Has mm -hmm. been, been triggered, but I can under I can describe that mm -hmm. moment as a thirteen year old, but I can't describe the moment in my feeling memory because I don't have words for it. No, that's true, but if if we let go of the words, because if if you, um, I've been trained as a sensory motor psychotherapist, so. Um, this is a, a body-based method, right? If we follow that line and if we follow the work of, of a psychiatrist like Bruce Perry, you can see that the feeling memory and, and the nervous system come into play. And even if there's no words, there are bodily responses, like yeah. you turned away. So the turning away is a response. 
So in a therapy session, you could do the turning away and we could kind of see if, if we are mindful about that, what else evokes that for res response in your body. And if we can work with that, if we can either resolve it through um, an autonomic sensory motor response like sequencing the trembling and then stay with that and see where it takes you with, with a therapist with you. So only as much as someone can take, never, never violence and never uh, something a person can't take. And then see if something else pops up because often, even if you don't have the words and the memory, if you're in such a session, someone could say, oh, I must have been like a bad baby that they, they, they left me or that I got ended up in this in this hospital or in this orphanage. And that's then a thought that comes with a bodily memory and that can help you resolve because in the end, another part of you will say, but bad babies, how come babies are not bad? No baby is bad. Every baby needs to be cherished and held and and attuned to and and then you can kind of bring that that feeling of well sorrow and grief and 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 pain and you can bring that to the part that has felt so abandoned and left left alone and rejected even if you will bring it back to the the rugby game and that's healing too, because then you do it together with a with a therapist and and something often then shifts in this bodily response and in this felt memory. It doesn't um, make the memory different because this has happened to you, but it kind of takes the the edges, the sharp edges of the memory and and of the um, automatic responses. So are you are you describing therapy as the surfacing of these uh, pre-verbal traumas, the surfacing of yeah. stuff that's in the feeling memory, not in their cognitive, in their brain, yeah. in the conscious mind? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, actually, yeah. If something has, if you've had a journey through life that starts with, um forced adoption or relinquishment or a mother that has been very, very anxious, not being able to keep her baby or, or whatever reasons you couldn't stay with a birth mom, then this is an imprint on your, on your body. And, and this is how I came to the body-based therapies because I started off cognitive like everybody because that's, every, that's evidence-based. So we start off with the evidence base and then we find that the dysregulation doesn't go away and that the nightmares don't go away and that there's a lot of unconscious stuff going around. So we need to kind of peel the layers of the onion and get back to, to, the, to the felt sense and to the felt memories and find ways to that, uh, for, for people to bear that and to, to come to a certain shift so they can, yeah, shape their life in the future, not being too much burdened by the past yeah. because we can't alter the past. I always wanted, I had a magic wand, like I, I really would have loved to have a magic wand and to say, oh, come in my therapy room and I will kind of do my trick and then this resolves. But it's always hard work and it's always going to the pain, acknowledging the pain, stay with the pain, with your therapist if if you have a good relationship and then it will resolve because you first have to be there you have to see the dragon in the eye before you can slay it right yeah so that's also with pain and with and that's healing healing is a a process that where you go into a dark dark tunnel and in the darkest moments you think well i'm never going to see the light again but then hopefully there's someone there for you that will guide you through the light. And the light will be a very, very tiny light in the beginning, but in the end, it will be brighter and brighter. And then you get out of the tunnel. And sometimes you can you look back and you see, oh yeah, that's my tunnel. I know you. I've been there, done that. 
yeah, and sometimes the pain will come back, but not as intense as when you're in the middle of it. Yeah. So I, I love this um, uh, contrast that you're making between bearing and burdening. Can you describe that in a little bit more detail for the listeners? Please? Yeah. If, if you're burdened by something, in as I see it, but it's only my personal opinion, then it's kind of something that's holding you back. It's holding you back from becoming the person you, you're supposed to be because you're, it will always kind of hinder you not being able to really enjoy something. Always this little voice in, 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 your, in your head, like, I'm not lovable. How can, how can my partner love me? How come, how come, why won't he leave me? And if you can bear that, that this, this start where there has been a break, uh, um, how would you say that in English? Sometimes the words are difficult. Um, if there has been a, a yeah, yeah, a, re a breakup because between the persons that have loved you and aren't there for you, then it's very hard to trust that someone will always be there. So if you have this burden, you can le learn to bear it by helping yourself feel more and more that you are connected to the person that is there for you. There's always someone you can find. And if it's your therapist initially, then from use the therapist to broaden your social circle and, and to learn to trust and to start friendships again and people start working with people again. And if it's not people, then there's animals. And there's, there's other ways to connect because connection, we all need connection. That's important. Yeah. So you're talking about trauma becoming less traumatic. Excuse me? So it trauma. sounds like you're talking about trauma being becoming less traumatic. Yeah. 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 It's, so there's it's about lowercase, yeah. lowercase T trauma. There's yeah. trauma and there's trauma. You know. There's yes. And and when it's full blown in the face, if you're in the if, if it really kind of takes you over then you need your therapist and you need someone to to help you um not not getting overwhelmed and finding ways to to soothe yourself to soothe your body to ground yourself in the here and now so the first phases of therapy are always finding new resources to help yourself stay in the here and now and even if there's a trigger or if you are triggered or if you, if you get in a situation that might be potentially triggering for you that you know what to do and how to soothe yourself again how to come back yeah and that's that's the first one and if if you can do that if you can stay within your probably most people that are listening have heard about the window of tolerance the modulation model model if you could stay within your window of tolerance then life becomes a lot easier but if you've had a lot of trauma with a big T, your window of tolerance is very narrow. So it's very hard to stay within your window of tolerance. So the first thing in therapy and in healing then is to expand the window a bit. So you you don't get triggered as easily or you know what to do when you get triggered this easily. Not, not by avoiding the triggers, but by finding ways to, to soothe your own body and to to help your own responses resolve yeah and then when once you can do that then you get into the second phase of therapy actually then you can address the trauma and then you can kind of see if we can get it the trauma responses work them through the system and help people well help people to become who they are and to really heal yeah so one of the phrases that really, or the words that really uh, stuck with me from my conversation last time was potential. Yeah. Yeah. So can, oh, yeah. That, that seems like a, that, this seemed like a great point in the conversation to kind of bring in the potential stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think everybody has his own or her own potential. And it's, if you've been, 
in a traumatic situation, it's very difficult to see the way out and to find your own potential, to find new ways or new means to express yourself or to be in the world or to engage with the world. So I always think in therapy, it's not only about uh, the trauma stuff or, or the heavy stuff. It's also about being in the normal world and what gives you joy? What what is where can you embark upon that really, really helps you to find and to fulfill your potential? So that could be something like um like playing a musical instrument, uh, going for walks with the dog, taking care of, of the horses, being in nature, writing. It, it, a lot of creative stuff helps you or your work if you, if you if you're working. And always finding ways to, and that's also expanding the window of tolerance, of course, finding ways to, yeah, to experience joy and to get your dopamine flowing again, because that's important. So it's it's always a, a two-side track. It's not only about healing. It's not only about addressing the trauma. It's also about helping people to experience joy and and, and reaching parts of their potential, getting new, finding new ways, actually. Yeah. So what would you, how would you put those, the, the two sort of two key words that we've been talking about so far in the last, whatever, 15 or so minutes, the, the word uh, perspective, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and the word potential. How do, how do, the, how could those two words sit together? Well, I think that if clients come and, and my practice, I have children as well as, uh, as adolescents, as adults, when people come, especially in the start of the therapy, their perspective is rather bleak in general because they think, oh, nothing will happen. It, it's, it's hard and it will never change. And to me, I, I'm kind of a broker of hope and a broker of new ways, always helping, trying to help people to find the perspective and to hang in there because sometimes it's also about hanging in and holding on because perspective can be something for the long term. And sometimes somebody sits across to me on the sofa and says, and then I ask, well, where would you like to be in let's say like a year? And then, especially if, if we've just started therapy, they might go totally blank and say, a year? I don't even know what tomorrow will bring. So they don't have any clue about their own potential or their own perspective. So these, these will become issues or issues, issues is maybe a, a wrong word, but it seems in therapy to address like, well, what do you like? What makes you tick? As a as a small child, what did you like to play with? What 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 interested you? What kind of books do you like? What kind of movies do you like? What what really if I if I come in the middle of the night and I wake you up, what and I say, come on, we're going to what can I wake you up for? What what would really really excite you and and make you feel like yes, that's what I what I'd like to do. So in order to find like these small islands and these small sparks of joy for them to engage with the world again, and in engaging with the world on the on one hand, they can find their potential, and on the other hand, we can start the healing process. So it's to me, it's two. A two side track always, and for parents and for yeah people in therapy, sometimes I'm the one that needs to have them help them to hang on hang in there because it's never a quick process. There's never a quick fix. It's always a longer process because you want to discover yourself. You, there's there's a lot of stuff you need to clean out or clean up or get rid of or even bury sometimes because I'm I don't think that um I think that the the patient or the client is the one that has a say in whether he wants to address the trauma or wants ways to to well avoid it I don't think we need to push we should push people in um well you need to do this or you need to do that it's always the choice sometimes it's not your time we know it's there we know we can address it but maybe it's not now maybe it's in another moment or maybe it's never yeah 
I, I used you see that phrase a lot about realizing our potential. Ah, oh, yeah. 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 Now, to me, that seemed like um, uh, achieving what we're capable of. Yeah. Um, and that seemed like hard. That that seemed like a weight, and um, you know. So uh, I'm I, I I swim a lot, right? So I have the you know realizing my potential is w- winning. You know, winning the, the 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 swimming race at school when I'm uh-huh. ten. Right? Mm-hmm. So that that was one definition of realizing my potential. And that sounded like hard work, and that sounded like putting stuff off. Mm-hmm. And, and and then I came to another, or well, I came to a realization about realization, right? So that it's got a different meaning. Mm-hmm. So realizing my potential is about okay. I I see, I could win. Uh huh. So it, yeah, it's more about um, the future. It's more about. Uh, optimism it's more about a shift in my perspective it's not actually the moment the dreams comes true yeah it it's the seeing that the dream could come true and that kind of to me sits with hope yes yeah so yeah we're, we're talking about hope of something for the future yeah and, and also about the joy of being able to do to to swim just to swim today and to train for that and having fun in the swimming and not actually having a a, a goal or a medal at the end or so the achieving I like to get the competition and the evaluation out of it I'd like to have it in the here and now and now with the realization that it could be more if you want to or if 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 the time's right or if it happens to be on, become on your path, because sometimes there's also a bit of luck in play, and or, or yeah, yeah, like so that. How can you, um, how can you kind of set out? I I've given you an example with swimming because that's the only one that uh-huh. to my mind. How how can you? How how do you see realization and um? and hope and healing how how do you see those kind of fit into you wow that's a very nice and interesting question philosophical also i think um i think realization is being in contact with with what the ifs people would or internal family systems people would would call your your core self yourself because yourself is is yeah that's that's gold, that's your source that can never never break actually. And then realizing what you would like to do with your life and how you would like to do it. And not, um, it's not like someone said last, you know, a client said, I'm gonna be a millionaire in a year, but he has no education, nothing. And then I said, how realistic is it? Because you, wouldn't it be nice if you had your own house and a job? And so it's it's also about realization. It's also about something. It has to be realistic. It has to be fitting for the person that is coming to you. So it's it's also a a, a tailor made thing, and it has something somebody has to discover for him or her, for him or herself. So, um, and and the hopeful thing is. I always think that you can be what you want um, given the talents you've got. So first we start with what, what are you good at? What's your thing? I mean, if you're very uh, uh, dyslectic, it may be not your thing to become a writer, but you could be something, you, maybe you can paint perfectly. You can, you, you can, you can paint or you can, you can be very good in, in, in maths or in anything else. So it's also the hope thing is about the future and the here and now. It's about discovering what's good for you, 
what can you do? And everybody has some talent. So it's also about discovering the talent and then embracing that and finding a way to to make that larger and to to embark on that. Yeah. I had a, uh, I did a, a, recorded a podcast with a fellow adoptee called Linda Pivak um, last night. Uh, and after we finished, after we finished recording, um, I I had a, I had a bit of a moment, a, a teary, a teary moment. Uh-huh. And it, it was all about how, how much darkness I see uh, the opposite of hope, how much I see in adoptee circles mm-hmm. and the impact that that's having on me. Yeah. And and I'm assuming it, it has impacts on other people. So yes. we're, 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 we're so... We're, we're we're so keen to get others to recognize our trauma i i feel that i'm in a way i'm absolutely re-traumatizing myself uh-huh. mm. yeah sometimes i think this is what is happening currently in in the adoptive community and also in the community of the birth mothers because if you revisit your trauma in anger and in, in 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 despair, then it's like a little seed that grows a lot. And you need we need recognition for it, and we do need restorative action sometimes, especially if things have gone wrong. But I can see the darkness, and sometimes the darkness is so very big that it's really hard to put hope um, in the, uh, put, put hope in the balance as well, to put hope on the skills as well. And if that's the case, then we have to stay with the darkness first and trust, trust and, and, and yes, hope that at some point the light will come in again. But I, I yeah, I remember having had a supervisor and, and he was, in his 70s when he stopped working and he worked especially it wasn't a supervisor in the adoptive field he was, he worked mainly in the child protection services with abused children and he said i need to stop because my skin has grown grown too thin i can't i can't leave it anymore and that kind of popped up when you gave this example because if if you are constantly working with all the pain and with all the darkness, then it affects you. Of course it affects you. Because we, we resonate with, with the people we talk to and, and the people we we want to help and we want to get insights and we want to we want to bring a message of hope. And we know that for some people life is too hard and, and some people have been dealt a hand that is too difficult to to find the hope or to find the light. Yeah. And that is very sad. I don't I don't want to I'm always um I'm uh, I have a private practice, but I often get referrals after they've had other therapists. Not not saying that I can solve everything, but the only thing I can do, and maybe that's the most important thing in any therapy is hang in there, stay with somebody, really be present with everything that comes up, even if it's that this really, really big darkness, or even if it's the really, really hard grief, not being afraid of that. But if if you talk about the body memories and the, the felt memories, stay with somebody because in the beginning, they were alone. And the only experience that can counteract that is the experience of another human being being there for you, even if it's only in therapy. But it takes an experience to antidote an experience. So the only way to to find hope and to find new experiences 
is to have them experientially in your room and be there, fully be there, be present, be there as a person. And yeah, sometimes that's hard work for a therapist too, because sometimes after a session, I really need to unwind and need to do my own resourcing because I don't want people to, to experience those things. I don't want children to, well, yeah. Whatever you can fill it in, you, you can you can fill you can fill in the blanks. Everybody that is listening can fill in the blanks, and then I think we have a shitty world. And I think, okay, well, take a deep breath, do my own resourcing, listen to some music, go for a walk, go outside, um, do some felting or some pottery, and then I think, okay, well, I'm going to be there, and that's what I can do. That's what I can offer. It can be there, and that's important. So you you said something there that I, a, a quote you alluded to a quote that's on your website about it takes an experience to counter an experience. Is that, is yeah. that yeah, yeah, to antidote an experience. Antidote, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, for me, seeing that quote this morning, you know, when I was preparing for the call, it had it really resonated for me because you, you're talking about an experience, um, not a new idea. No. Not, no. not a theory, not a new idea, no. but an experience. And, I, and to, to me, that kind of underlines what happens in, you know, in, in a group. Mm-hmm in a group, especially a group in person. Yeah. It, it's an yeah. experience. Yeah. So if we if we if we look at uh, compare to 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 learning, right, to to perspective, to mm-hmm. potential perspective shifters. We're looking for a shift in our potential. We're looking mm-hmm. for a shift we're looking for a shift in the way we see our potential. We're looking for a shift along our healing curve. Yeah. Or um, we're looking like sometimes I think about healing and it's it's not a curve. You know, I, I, I thought, you know, learning curve, healing curve. That tends to be smooth. The curve is smooth. And, yeah, and, it's not, and it's he, not the healing curve isn't smooth. It, you know, it, it's, it's peaks and troughs. It mo- it's more yeah. like snakes and ladders with, a, mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. an overall um, upward trajectory. Yeah, but it's, yeah. it's in step changes. And and the uh, the shift in perspective is, is the vertical jump, the vertical yeah. increase. Uh, yeah. If we if we are envisaging a series of steps going upwards, right? So there's a horizontal bit, and then there's a vertical bit, and then there's a horizontal yeah. bit, and there's a vertical bit, and, it, and so yeah. so a shift in perspective is that vertical. Is that vertical stuff? If we're looking to for our uh, to 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 heal, to progress along the steps to healing, one way we can do it is in a book. The opposite, you know, not the opposite, but at another way of doing it, we can do it with a, a, a therapist, and then another way we can do it is in a group. But the the richness of the experience, the richness of the antidote experience mm-hmm. is going to be way stronger with a therapist or with a group mm-hmm. than it is listening to you and me talk. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Or, or yeah. reading a book. We're, we're, yeah. we're, we're, we're going to have, we're, we've, you know, you talked about uh, finding the things that work for us we have to find the right antidote experiences yes because we've got this experience this experience of relinquishment or abandonment that you know that happened for me 57 years ago mm-hmm. we've got uh, there's no there's there's no cognitive there's no memory there's no cognitive yeah. memory of that some adoptees do remember more. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. 
Yeah. But we've got to find we've got to find what works for us. And I think we've got to put ourselves in the right places for the healing shift to happen. And that and that's the richness of the experience that strikes me. Yeah, that's true. And it's always you need you need another person. People are people. People are people persons. So people, you you can't do it alone. It's it's like actually it's like the dyadic dance with a ba between the baby and the mother. It's attunement, and it's the attunement that helps someone to come further to to go a bit on the vertical ladder, and then real the realization when when you make a step then there also comes grief and there and there, there come tears because how come i realize this now so many years after i started my journey because there's also there's also always on therapeutic gain there's also tears with come with it because there's and that's not the tears of um that's not the the, but yeah, it's it's some so it's it's the pain of the realization that you can experience this now, finally. So that that's that's also yeah, that's also part of it. So and it's not it's not a curve, no. It, and sometimes you will fall back, and then I think at at these 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 moments when you fall back, it's important that you are held then again. So I, I always try, and this gets harder the longer I have my practice, that um, if people want to come back after they've finished their therapy sessions, if something happens in life, it's always easier to pick up uh, a process than to start a new process. So I always try, if, if you've been with me, and even if it's five or 10 years later, something happens and you want to come back, then I try to make a space for you. Because I think that's that's what it's all about. It's about relationships. It's about continuity. It's about attunement. It's about um, attachment. And attachment relationships are relationships that that last and that you can pick up uh, after not having seen someone sometime. So that that's, but that's sometimes that's difficult because it's in a practical way difficult. But we. Until now, I've always found a way to do it this way. And then often we only need two or three session, uh, sessions and then it's done. Because, and if someone then would start anew with a therapist, they would have to start the whole story again. And and you couldn't get into the, the, the deep layers. And that's, that's a pity. And it's about the healing of the adoptees, but it's also about the healing of, of birth mothers and about adoptive parents and, it's all the, the triangle comes in the mix. It's about connection and about acknowledging. Yeah, the, the, it's like what Brodzinski called the disenfranchised grief. Also, there's a lot of layers of grief that we need to also address. Yeah. What yeah. does disenfranchised mean? Well, um, as I get it, but it's not English. Is not my first language. Yeah. Is it's not acknowledged. It's not acknowledged that there's there's layers of grief and layers of that kind of prohibit also the connection that that are difficult that making it more difficult to connect. I mean, the baby that cannot grow up with its parents grieves, and this grief becomes also a felt memory. And the parent often in the in the Netherlands we do not have many domestic adoptions. So I, I speak mainly of the intercountry adoptions. Many parents have held an idealized biological child in their head and they have stepped up to adoption because they really want a child and really want they have a lot to offer, but they have to have had their own grieving process as well. And the mother that cannot take care of her birth child is also confronted with a lot of grief. And this grief pops up at certain points in life time and again. 
it's around birthdays, it's around Christmas time, it's around big family reunions, it's about, um, well, you name it. And we need to, if, if we talk about healing, we do not need to talk only about trauma, but also about the grieving process and about being able to, to sit with that and, and to acknowledge the fact that, yeah, you've lost a lot. And we can say, yeah, but you've gained a lot. You've got a nice house. You've got blah, blah, blah. And we know, we know the big studies say that most adoptees, in spite of the adoptees we see, mainly in therapy, most adoptees do well and are satisfied with their life, but it comes at a cost. They've yeah. worked very hard to get there. Yeah. And I think society needs to acknowledge that cost and needs to acknowledge that it's hard work if you've been dealt the hand of adoption and or, or of relinquishment, it's hard work. And, and we need to acknowledge how hard people have worked, and especially if it's inter-country or interracial adoptions, there's also the cultural dimension and the, the dimension of discrimination and the microaggressions. A lot comes into the mix. And we need to acknowledge that and address it and, and find ways to, yeah, if you want to heal, you want the full Monty, you want the full package and you want to be, to reach your potential, be the person you want to be. But that also means that you have to address the difficult themes in your life and and be sad about some, some things that have happened to you. So, to what extent then do you think this lack of acknowledgement uh, stops us healing? Yeah, I think so. I think for some people, they need the acknowledgement first and also the societal acknowledgement before they are even able to embark on their personal journey. And some people embark on their personal journey and have do not do not mind the societal stuff. In the Netherlands, currently, there is a huge um, group that says we need to stop adoptions because it will, it's never okay. I've worked the child protection system and I wish we could have each child grow up with their own parents, but reality is different. And I think children need permanency, but please, please, in connection with yeah, with birth families and with everybody that has once been a part of the life of the child. But that's, well, that's quite a way to go, yeah. yeah. That's quite a way to go, yeah. So this lack of acknowledgement then clearly does play a, uh, a it, it proves to be a, a barrier to people's healing. Um, yeah. What, what else, what else do you think uh, hinders our healing? Well, sometimes I think sometimes there's fear too because it's really frightening to go inside and, and, and see what's there. And and some for some people, that's too big a task. They would like more the cognitive explanations and the books and and um and ways to to well the quick fixes maybe or the recipes on how to do it because if if you really need to find it out for yourself that's difficult and sometimes very scary some some people really don't yeah. don't have the courage to go inside because they are so afraid what they will find and then i think it's for therapists to acknowledge that and really to explore why, why, how come, and why, and and what can we do to at least make your journey the journey you want it to be? Because it's not it's not my journey. I'm not going to um, force someone to do something he's not, he or she's not up to because it's their process. The only thing I do is to facilitate the process and to give some options, and then you can. You can see what happens. But sometimes it's too fearful. Or sometimes people 
have so many other things going on in their life that it's too much to embark on your own process. It's just too much. You need to take care of your parents who are sickly. You need to take care of children. There's a job. And then there's your own healing. So how does it come into the mix? So then we have to work on how can you take care of yourself? Because in order to take care of other people, you need to have good self-care. And self-care is one of the hardest things to do. Yeah. yeah. And permitting what's, yourself that to do that. Yeah. What's coming back for me on the back of this is uh, my own ability to um, see what, what's happening actually in a therapy session. So I was, I was looking at my kind of like my adoption folder that I got from mm -hmm. uh, um, from the social worker you know seven or eight years ago uh, and then in there there's a there's a page of of kind of random notes that a therapist that I was working with at the time uh, uh, typed up and gave to me at the end of our session and she she said that uh, so I, I thought, right, I was laying my heart on the line, right? I mm -hmm. thought I was really op opening up on about feelings. And when I got her notes, she didn't think that at all. So, she, yeah, she, she, she said that it said something like, um, Simon, um, you know, goes to, goes to the cognitive place, you know, yeah, and she and she didn't tell that to you. She she told me she told me that. Yeah, she, uh -huh. she told me that. Um, I can't I can't remember that she told me just when she gave me the notes or or, or what it was, but um, I, I, I'm trying to figure a question here. Uh, so when when I think about fear. Mm -hmm. uh, I think well, I, I'm I'm not I'm not afraid of I, I I'm I'm not afraid of a therapist. I'm not I'm not afraid of opening up. No. I, I I went to you know I'm, I'm talking about this on the podcast now. This is eight years ago. Uh, you know I I, I, I wasn't afraid. Uh, I wasn't afraid to. In my opinion, I wasn't afraid to seek out a therapist and have a conversation with a, ther a therapist and, th and do this sort of stuff. Um and yeah there was something within me actually in the session where she thought I was holding back, where she mm -hmm. thought I was, uh, you know, going to, go, going to, going towards the intellectual rather than going to the emotion. And I'm, I'm just wondering how common that is, you know, uh, I think that's quite common, but it's also for a therapist quite easy to address. You can address it. It's procedural. It's what kept you alive. So it's a, it's a very, very good way of coping. So we can explore that way and we can see if you're interested, if there's another way or if there's a part of you that we haven't seen yet. And then, then it isn't like I'm evaluating my patient like he's holding back or he's not doing what I want him to do it's just that it's interesting and that that's what I would like to bring across always be curious like there's a reason why you do it and obviously this has brought you a lot so good for you and keep doing that but is it is it helpful for us now in therapy Maybe it is, okay, then we embark on that journey. If it's not, and if you're interested in being curious if there's something more or something else that's underneath it or some other part of you that, that wants to also get some attention, then we might explore that. And if not, that's okay too. So what I'm getting from this is that we're talking about a shift in in this instance we're talking about a shift yeah. in we're talking about a shift in in perspective to mm -hmm. um 
well what word would what one word would you say that i've that i'm just that i described to you then avoidance or um, what what would uh, what would no, i would i would say that um that this has brought you a lot so it, it i would say oh this is how you always done it i can see it it's it's like nearly automatic so would you be interested in looking at this pattern and to what extent it's helpful for you and to what extent it might be obstructing you to get into a deeper layer. Yeah. Okay, the pattern then. Yes, so, I would go into the pattern, pattern, not into not in yeah, pattern. I would because I think it's obviously what we do is we go into the pattern. We go we go into our procedural way of of, of reacting. I do the same. I did the same. I mean, as a therapist, you've had your own therapy. So I, I kind of resonate with this. Like, um, yeah, I go into my head. I'm 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 good with theory. I like I, I need to have it all cleared out and have the, the models in my head. Uh, but the minute a therapist says, Well, mm, that's nice, but let's see how, how does it work for you? Check inside. Is it okay to check inside? Then you get me on a on a different level. Yeah. Then you and and then then I say, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, I would love to, but not today because I'm too busy or whatever. But then a seed has been planted, and if I then go back home in the car or on my bike, I would think, shit, she got me there. I can all I've I've always been able to 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 be able to to tell or to explain or to keep it in a cognitive shift but she's right there's something underneath i need to explore it so if i can sum up my feelings on this in or what, what uh, my feelings on this in one sentence and, and what i think you're doing what you're saying is so i was criticizing the pattern okay mm -hmm. Whereas you're saying, no, the pattern was natural. Yeah. And but you're you're changing my perspective on the pattern. Do you yes. see what I mean? You're changing. Yeah. You, you, you you're sharing your perspective. Mm -hmm. so I'm thinking this is a bad thing. So I go in saying, you know, like um, I I, I go and I, I go in saying this is a bad thing. And and you say rather than you saying it's a bad thing, what you just say? Well, no, this is this is the pattern that you've been running, Simon, and it and it's kept you alive, so it's a good thing. Yes, uh, it, it 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 was. It seemed like it it, it served you in the past. Mm -hmm. Do we want to see whether it could something else, a different pattern, could serve you in the future? So rather than criticizing the pattern, you're yeah, uh, you're looking at another way. Of, yeah, being curious about it and. And looking in a way like, well, in what situations can it still serve me? Because it has served you, so it, we need we need not uh, abandon it fully. But we can see if there's another pattern that can be on top of it, or on the side, or whatever. Okay. So, to what extent? Should, let's make it this not about me uh, a minute. Or let's see. Let's just explore it. To what extent do uh, adoptees criticize their patterns like I have done? I think to a huge extent, because they everybody, um, well, you come to therapy because you want to change something. And then you say, what I wanted, because I haven't done it right. And then I think, well, haven't you? Look at you. You're here. You came here. You came in. You came to therapy, it has served you well. It's just that it doesn't serve you fully anymore. So let's find a way to heal, to find a new perspective, to find your potential, because obviously this pattern doesn't serve you as you would like to. That's why you came to therapy. So we're looking at the pattern and we're looking at how it can be maybe tweaked a bit or maybe 
just used at your work situation or just with this strange family member or whatever. But we're curious about when does it serve you and when doesn't it? And what belief is underneath it, what core belief, and what body responses are coming with it, and what emotions. And then we can kind of see, unravel it, be curious, explore, be accepting to everything that comes. And that's that's important because I think this acceptance, people are criticized and adoptees are very often criticized. They're, they're very, in, in the, well, because the inter-country adoption, they're very visible because they're of color often. So they're always in the spotlight and there's a lot of microaggressions. So if, yeah, the, the criticism and the self-criticism is huge. And, and that's that's one of the layers we need to really to peel off. It can be mild to yourself. It's like it's like a swimming. You can be mild to you because if you your joy is in swimming, you mean be the best swimmer. It's just that swimming is so nice. So please do swim because that's your potential. Fascinating. Is there anything you'd like to share that I've not asked you about, Annie? Well, I I really enjoyed the talk. I hope that people that are listening find it helpful. And the only thing I want to say is be mild to yourself and be curious. Just be curious. Don't be too evaluating. Be curious. And find out what has happened to you. And if necessary, find help. Get some support. And, and be yeah, be kind to yourself because it's about healing, but it's also to start with the Leonard Cohen song again. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. And in healing, there's this post-traumatic growth. And that growth can be really tremendous and really great. And I always hope that my clients and that the people I encounter, that they can yeah, get the experiences that help them grow again. Because everybody deserves it to be happy and to be, to have the life they would have loved to have. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I love this. I stumbled across that phrase, post-traumatic mm -hmm. growth. I don't know, sometime last year, I think, maybe the year before. And I, I just I just loved it. And, I, I, and then, and, and there's, part of me that's crying that, about the fact that that, that uh, society is ob obsessed with PTSD, mm -hmm. not PTG. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we should we should focus on the growth and not not on the disorders. So I I, I hate the labeling and stuff like that. We need to do that in order to get funding, but I'd rather work with themes and with, yeah, exploring what people need instead of with labeling and stuff like that. Thanks, Annika. Thanks, listeners. Thank you. Bye Thank bye. you and thanks, listeners. Bye. Bye.